I don't know if this actually happened or if it was just in my imagination, but the clouds parted. I was lying in the grass, looking up at the sky, and you know, the clouds parted, and this little voice came in and said, like, you actually, like, you have more control than you think here. America's public America's enemy, public number, enemy one number one is number one is drug, drug abuse. abuse. Drug abuse. Drug abuse. Magic mushrooms, MDMA, LSD, ketamine. We all know that drugs are bad, or are they? In 2021, the tide is turning for one class of mind-altering drugs known as psychedelics, at least in the fields of medicinal and psychological research, where it's proving to have a radical impact in the treatment of mental health conditions. But first, a little history lesson. When I say psychedelics, it's hard not to think of the hippies, artists and outliers of the 1960s counterculture who were famous for their experimentation with illegal mind-altering drugs. That all changed with President Nixon's war on drugs in 1971. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. He sought to cut national and international drug networks and criminalize the use of psychedelics, which also drove out most scientists from the field of research. Fifty years later, scientists are back and taking psychedelics mainstream. I'm here at Imperial College London, where legal trials have been held with psilocybin, a naturally occurring psychedelic compound in fungi. Imperial and other respected institutions such as John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland and the University of California in Berkeley have opened centres to study psychedelics. But before we go on, a definition. Psychedelics are a class of drugs that alter mood and perception and can cause hallucinations. And one of the pioneers of psychedelic research is Dr. Rick Doblin. An illegal LSD trip in college eventually led him to study these compounds to treat mental health and get the medical authorities on board. I grew up believing all the propaganda about LSD. You know, you do it a few times and you're certifiably insane. You do it a bunch of times, you've got deformed babies because you're going to have chromosome damage. So I believed all that. Um, later found out, of course, that wasn't true. And that was where I started thinking, gosh, you know, maybe I'll experiment. This was 10 years before he'd even heard about MDMA. At different doses, it relaxes the barrier, you could say, or the membrane between the conscious and the unconscious mind and it permits things to come to the surface. So that's why it's very good in therapy as well. Dr. Doblin eventually founded the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, better known as MAPS, in 1986. It's now a multi-million dollar research and advocacy organization that employs 130 neuroscientists, pharmacologists, and legal specialists, and is laying the groundwork for what's being called a psychedelic revolution. They're researching MDMA, the club drug also known as ecstasy or molly, to see if, when combined with therapy, it can help heal post-traumatic stress disorder. The goal is to win approval for drug-assisted therapies from the US Food and Drug Administration, and they're getting closer. Recently, the medical journal Nature Medicine published the results of the first Phase 3 clinical trial conducted with psychedelic-assisted therapy. Dr. Doblin chose MDMA specifically because it had the best chance of making it through the system. So MDMA is more gentle than the other psychedelics. It doesn't dissolve the ego in the same way that the classic psychedelics do. It doesn't make people think that they're dying or going crazy in the same way. It's the easiest to integrate. You know, some people say it's not even a psychedelic. Research has shown that MDMA paired with counselling brought marked relief to patients with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. PTSD is a mental health condition caused by exposure to life-threatening or traumatic events. While it's traditionally associated with soldiers and those working in conflict zones, we now realise it's much more prevalent, with estimates that as many as 8 million people will have it in any given year. It's a whole new approach Dr. Doblin hopes will be officially accepted as an alternative to long-term dependency on prescription drugs. So you only get MDMA three times. So this is the opposite story of pharma that wants you to take a pill every day for the rest of your life. This is, basically it's therapy, that the MDMA helps the therapy be more effective. 
And then the goal is to make it so that when people are done, they don't need drugs. They don't need MDMA. We, we've sort of altered their trajectory, helped them get out of stuck patterns, help them learn how to let emotions express and not be overwhelmed by them. And then as, as we see, they keep getting better on their own. When MDMA enters the brain, chemical messengers are released, resulting in an increase in neurotransmitter activity. Higher levels of oxytocin are produced in the hypothalamus and released by the posterior pituitary. This hormone is usually released into the bloodstream in response to love and childbirth. MDMA also reduces activity in the amygdala, which is the fear processing part of the brain, which is increased in PTSD patients. But that is balanced out by the increased activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is where we think logically and rationally. Other chemicals are also released, including serotonin, known as the happy chemical, which helps maintain a stable mood. Dopamine, involved in regulating mood and focus. And norepinephrine, part of the fight and flight response, which helps regulate mood, anxiety, sleep and energy. MDMA also increases connectivity between the amygdala and hippocampus, which is where we can store memories into long-term storage. Which is why Dr. Doblin says it's effective in treating post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. So the other thing about PTSD, it's about the, the trauma is never really in the past. It's always about to happen or still happening. So you're able to process the memory because the fear is reduced. You're able to think more logically about it, and then you're able to put it into long-term storage. So that's called fear extinction and memory reconsolidation. There's been a steady increase of encouraging data from legal trials. The peer-reviewed paper on MAPS Phase 3 results was released in May 2021. 90 people took part in the study. What we showed is 32% of the people in the control group that had therapy without MDMA. Now, these are severe, chronic PTSD patients, PTSD at least 14 years, an average of 14 years. One third had PTSD more than 20 years. Um, we had 32% uh, no longer had PTSD in the control group, but it was 67% at the two month follow up with therapy plus MDMA. And what about the side effects? Are there any? Yeah, no, all, all drugs have side effects and no drug works for everybody. While a person at a dance rave may overheat, Dr. Doblin's participants are inside and hydrated. There can be muscle tension, teeth grinding and acute sweating while MDMA is active. And therapists keep an eye on blood pressure increases and exclude people with hypertension. Again, we encase this in a therapeutic setting. So we give the MDMA at 10 in the morning. Uh, therapists leave at 6. It's an 8-hour session. Um, for many of our sites, people spend the night at the treatment center. Therapists come back the next day for integrative psychotherapy. So we think from a um, physiological perspective that uh, the risks are minor and manageable. Um, I'd say the biggest risk psychologically is that people who have been unable to process their trauma, often they've taken prescription medications to reduce their symptoms. We require people to taper off of all their psychiatric medications to be in the study because um, they blunt the effect of MDMA. But the, what that means is that people are a bit raw. Their emotions are coming to the surface, which we explain to them is good. You've been you know, muting your emotions, but that's not helping solve the problem. And we're going to help you bring these symptoms even more to the surface. So the biggest concern is that people will be unable to manage these uh, this emotions that they've previously suppressed. And we also find that um, we have very low dropout rates in the study compared to prolonged exposure, which is one of the therapies for PTSD, where you have to repeat your trauma over and over and over. You know, a lot of people drop out of psychotherapies because it's too painful. So I think we've got a very excellent safety profile. While the study could be significant in getting the drug approved, some scientists warn that more research is needed using more participants. They also point out that the participants were self-selecting or volunteered for the study, so the results may not be representative of all trauma survivors. Dr. Doblin's study focused on MDMA, but it also holds significant potential for the advancement of other psychedelics in the treatment of psychological disorders. One of them is psilocybin, a naturally occurring compound found in some mushrooms. 
Here at Imperial College London, a small trial of 59 people showed psilocybin had therapeutic potential in people who suffered from moderate to severe depression. The results showed that while depression rates went down in the group taking antidepressants and in the group taking psilocybin, reductions happened more quickly in the psilocybin group and were more impactful. A larger trial is needed to validate the results, but the excitement is growing both in the scientific community and for sufferers of major depression, like Kevin Matthews. Yeah, um, well for myself, I mean, I, I, I think generally folks' experience of depression is, is varied obviously, but for me it was really a loss of motivation. It was a loss of drive and, and a lot of self-talk, uh, really negative self-talk talking down to myself, um, feelings of unworthiness, feelings of guilt, feelings of shame, feelings of not being good enough. And, and that slowly over time really crept in to become more of the, like the dominant conversation I was having with myself. Kevin was a junior at the US Military Academy when he was first diagnosed. I was seeing a psychologist, you know, I was pretty given, given the traditional treatment, right? Put on antidepressants and a sleeping aid and uh, that's about as far as they could go uh, at that time. They work for some people, they don't work for others. They can make the problem worse. But, you know, for me, it really just numbed out the good and the bad. And so I was really just turning into kind of an, an automaton, not exploring my feelings, still, still pushing them down. This was just the beginning of Kevin's journey to heal. But it was a complete accident that he ended up taking psilocybin, which at the time was illegal. Uh, what I remember, I don't know if this actually happened or if it was just in my imagination, but the clouds parted. I was lying in the grass looking up at the sky and, you know, the clouds parted and I, I realized this little voice came in and said, like, you actually, like, you have more control than you think here. Like, it, it was a perspective shift for me where I, I realized that I no longer had to be a victim to to my depression. I no longer had to be a person that made the choice to have a lifelong diagnosis and that I could actually make some changes in my daily life to, to start to heal. Kevin was so changed by the experience, it led him to become the campaign manager for Decriminalize Denver, a group working to make psilocybin legally accessible for therapeutic or recreational purposes. Uh, we decriminalized psilocybin mushrooms in Denver on May 7th, 2019. Three weeks later, um, Oakland decriminalized all naturally occurring psychedelics. And now we're in a, in a place where we have at least six cities in the U.S. that have decriminalized mushrooms or other psychedelics. We have um, the state of Oregon, which has created a, a, a regulated services or, or medical model for access. So there's a very good chance that we may see psychedelics decriminalized in the state of California by the end of the year. Psychedelics are still illegal in many parts of America and around the world, but the use of these drugs in a therapeutic setting could be on the cusp of entering mainstream medicine. The need for new therapies has become urgent, with soaring numbers of mental health sufferers, suicides and opioid addiction. Have you noticed there's been a shift around the world in terms of people looking at psychedelics as an option to treat mental health disorders? There, there's been an enormous shift and I, I'll, I'll give you a, an example of the first person that we've treated in Europe as part of our drug development to make MDMA into a medicine in Europe. Um, the first person was a police officer with PTSD. So 50 years ago you know, you would not get a police officer volunteering for MDMA research. Not 40, not 30, not 20, not 10 years ago, not even five years ago. MAPS is also gathering political support in the US, working with two members of Congress on a bill to try and give $25 million to the Department of Defense for research and another $25 million to the Veterans Administration for research for PTSD. So what happens next? Will MDMA psychotherapy be released around the country, around the world? I mean, what's holding you back? Money. Money is holding us back. But we have to do a second phase three study. That'll take us another 14 to 16 months. Then we apply to the FDA. They have a six to eight month review process. So first half of 2023, we think it'll be approved in the US and in Israel and Canada. 
because we've got sites in Israel, Canada, and the U.S. for our first phase three study. We're just starting to treat people in Europe. We think Europe will be a year or so behind the U.S., depending on if we can get the funding for Europe. Australia is moving forward. We've done studies in Brazil. We're working with people in Armenia, Bosnia, South Africa, Rwanda, Somaliland. The list is growing, but it's important to remember it's against the law to use and supply these drugs in most countries. Self-medication is dangerous and can even cause death. The trials are allowed to go ahead because they're medically and legally approved. Further research is needed, but the studies done so far show these may have a curative and lasting impact. Antidepressants may work better for someone else than, than psilocybin does or MDMA. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to, I, I firmly believe that we need to uh, fully decriminalize all psychedelics and, and then create, you know, ethical, regulated, accessible um, models so folks can actually have access to treatment. It's all finished. I know you want more Razor stories, so don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you soon.